Hi there. Our next presenter is retired Dean and Professor of Biology, recently moved from Florida to New Hampshire and is in the process of rebuilding his ON30 layout, set up for the northern New Mexico where he was born. He is the manager of the NMRA's Modeling with the Masters program and also has a seat on the board of directors. We welcome MMR525, Mr. Jim Gore. Oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm not going to let you look at my ugly mug too long, so I'm going to tell you a story about building Grandpa's gas station. And I don't mean a gas station called Grandpa's gas station. I'm talking about my Grandpa's gas station. And if I can get this to work right, I hope you see it. There we go. Uh, it's sort of a lesson in prototype research, a little bit CAD design and cardstock, which I enjoy building with considerably and a thing called GIMP and the memories of a six-year-old boy. Um, so let me start off by saying how I got there. And this is not Grandpa's gas station. Uh, this is a place in Como, Colorado called the um, Diamond Bar. And the first time I saw a picture of the diamond bar on, uh, on I guess it was Google or something like that, there was a sign underneath that said, a church in Como, Colorado. And I thought that was kind of unusual because I know that this place was a bar, hence the name Diamond Bar. And it was at one time also a house of ill repute. And uh, it was kind of funny to hear it called a church, but at any rate, um, about 10 years ago or so, Clever Models, the cardstock, one of the cardstock uh, kit manufacturers, had a contest and said, build us something brand new and original, and if you win, we'll build a kit for you. So I decided I would build the Diamond Bar. Now, fortunately, there was a um, book called Colorado Railroad Structures, and in there was actual line drawings for the uh, diamond bar. Um, there's the diamond bar. You can barely see the dot. You can see the diamond, but there's a bar across here also. Hence, like the old name, the diamond bar. Now, the Clever Models provides a whole set of textures, as they call them, of printed material, CAD designed, and one of the best is this one right here. It's called the Complete High Resolution Texture Collection. They don't sell them on CDs anymore. They sell them on thumb drives, but I've had mine for, gosh, at least uh, 10 years anyway. And in there, there was a texture that I could use to build the outside of the diamond bar, just some O-scale clabbered. Uh, there's the O-scale standing seam roof, and there's the double hung windows. As you can see, cardstock modeling requires that you do a lot of layering. As a matter of fact, it's the layering of cardstock images on top of other cardstock images that gives it its dimensionality. So, for example, this O scale standing seam, I print twice once to create the template to build the roof, and then once to cut out each and every individual seam and overlay it on the same one that was the base cardstock. And you can see the windows, for example, are actually built of about six or seven layers. And if you glaze it, it's eight or nine letters, excuse me, uh, layers. So ultimately, over a period of about three or four months of evenings, I built the diamond bar as it was when it was a uh, bar and uh, brothel, if you will. And you can see here, it's a little bit easier. This is the diamond bar. And it looks a little bit church-like, I suppose. Ultimately, this became a service station in the 1920s into the 1930s before it was abandoned at Como. So it's a, it's a pretty easy medium to work with. And you can add all the kinds of details that you can add to any other kind of a structure, despite the fact that it's built out of cardstock. You can see the individual standing seams, for example. You can install material like uh, chimneys and things like that, 
gooseneck lanterns, everything else. And of course, there's the backside with uh, the various sorts of things that most people don't want to see anyway. Well, I was fortunate enough to have won the contest. And uh, so they said, what do you what do you want us to make? And I said, well, design me grandpa's gas station. And the designer at that time, Tom Michnikovsky, said, well, send pictures. Tell me all about the prototype. Tell me all you can, and I'll try and design it. So I started sending him a few pictures. Now, my grandfather's gas station was built in Emporium, Pennsylvania. It was actually built very early in the 1930s. But this is a picture of Emporium, Pennsylvania in 1948. It's, uh, it, at that time, it had a population of 2,400. Just to show you how much this town has grown, I looked at the last census, it's now 2,500. So it's not grown very much. This is the Pennsylvania Railway as it goes as a, as a branch. It's the Driftwood Branch. That's the Cinnamahoning River. This is the Driftwood Branch of the Cinnamahoning River. Down the road, this direction is the town of Driftwood. My grandfather had a small gas station there also. I've seen the one in Driftwood built several times on several HO layouts because he had pictures of it on calendars. The only industry of import in uh, Emporium is right there. That's the Sylvania plant. It did something important during World War II. That's all I know. I don't know what they made other than vacuum tubes. But I'm not really interested in the Sylvania plant. That's the one lone spur off the Penzi there. I'm interested instead in that little tiny structure down there. That's Grandpa's gas station, the Gore service station. Um, my grandfather built that in the 1930s. It didn't quite look like that then. This is about 1946. It looked, at, and he, he sent to me before he died, a whole bunch of insurance photographs that were taken to, to give to the insurance company that insured his gas station. So there were several different views of the, of the gas station. And I used those and sent those off to the designer, Tom Michnikovsky, to build me this gas station. Um, it existed in various forms. You'll see through the pictures that the sign that says Gore Gas Station migrates all over the place, depending upon the year, different sizes and kinds of pumps, depending upon the year. Here it is a little bit earlier in its existence, and you see the Gore Service Station sign has moved across to a different roof. Here it is before the service bays were built very different kinds of pumps and things like that, but it's still the same old place. Brick roads, interestingly enough, this is Main Street going down through Emporium, Woodland, Woodland Avenue, this direction, and even the base of the gas station was brick. The Gore service station there, again, the signs migrated around. I'd love to see some models of this old style pump, but I don't have them. So I had to buy something a little more modern when I installed mine. So I thought, well, I'm going to get this thing right away and I'm going to build it. It turns out that it took about five years later and it still wasn't even close. And so I wrote to my friend Tom and I said, Tom, these are famous last words. Just send me what you have and uh, I'll figure out the rest. So about... Um, Oh, I'd say a week later, I got this single file. And I looked at that and I said, what the heck is that? And he said, well, it's all of the layers on a single file. And I said, well, how do I separate them? And he said, well, it's simple. You just put it on your Photoshop uh, program and you separate them out. You separate out the various layers and print them out. I don't own Photoshop. When I discovered how much Photoshop costs, I know I didn't want to order or own Photoshop. But I did find out something about something called GIMP. GIMP is the GNU Image Manipulation Program. It's freeware, at least when I bought it, it's freeware. I checked a couple of days ago, and I think it now costs $4. But it's a essentially a freeware version of Photoshop. And... Uh, 
Fortunately for me, it has a very shallow learning curve, at least for my purposes, and I was able to separate it out the layers relatively quickly. There's the sidewall of the garage, for example, and there's that mobile sign that you can cut out and superimpose on top of this one to give it some dimensionality. You have to remake those windows. I printed this out about four or five times to get all of the layers to make a three-dimensional window. There's the opening of the service bay. I cut this out a couple of times so that I could cut each and every letter out and superimpose it on top of those. For those who think that it's cardstock means it's simple, I always tell people as a computer modeler during my academic career, we used to have a sign in our lab that said, computer modeling is fast, efficient, and accurate. Pick any two. And that's exactly the same for cardstock modeling. If you want to do it well, you have to treat it as if it's a craftsman type structure or a scratch built structure. Here's, for example, the framing around the doors. That has to be superimposed. There's the other side of the service bay. And eventually I looked at these and I thought I have absolutely no idea what those are. And so eventually I cut them away and pretty much about a quarter of the grandpa's gas station, building grandpa's gas station, I had to do myself because the photographs didn't help the designer very much, it turns out. There's the bathroom door. Unfortunately, the door ultimately went here, not where it was printed on this particular version. And you start off. Now, one of the things that people worry about cardstock model is structural integrity. And so the layering actually builds structural integrity. The other thing that cardstock modeling needs to consider, and I know quite a few cardstock models, but very modelers, but very few of them do interiors. So I did this just to demonstrate that you can do an interior. You can find a texture that looks like an interior wall with wainscoting and everything else. And in this case, um, about two or three layers of material to look like a tiled floor. Those old checkerboard tiles that you used to see back in the 50s and the 60s. These tabs with the uh, red dots on them are gluing tabs. And you can either create them yourself, sometimes the models will have them built in. These will ultimately support the roof, for example. But I'm worried about the interior right now. This is a pretty typical interior. This is the interior as I remember it as about a seven-year-old boy. I do remember, for example, the Coca-Cola machine. I remember the gum dispenser. I remember the candy dispenser. And one thing that I discovered later on was that my grandfather loved a good $5, five cent cigar. And so he didn't have a cigarette machine, but he had a cigar machine that dispensed about six or seven different brands of cigars. So there's somebody in there sort of wiping his brow because it's a hot day in Pennsylvania. There's a service counter and everything else. All those good things that you want to see in the interior of a gas station. This is the door off to the office, which is back here. The bathroom is back there. That's the ladies bathroom. The men's bathroom is inside. And we won't get into why that occurs. Roofing is the same type of procedure. Here's the external roofing with this very strange looking uh, shingle pattern. There's an undercoating or an understory like that so that you have an underlayment that that fits upon so that then it becomes thicker and thicker. I use 110 pound cardstock and two or three layers makes it a fairly solid structure even though you've got an interior for it to go over. Here, for example, is one of the uh, roof supporting roofs. You have two or three layers. Here's that thing all cut out eventually. You paint the edges of this white uh, material with uh, some kind of a, an acrylic paint or something like that. It, it gets glued on top of that again to give it some dimensionality. So there's the office. And you start adding details and things like that. I know that it looks a little warped here. I have no idea why it looks like that because on the original or the model itself, it's not warped. 
But nevertheless, here's the office. And you can see inside some of the detail in there, it's illuminated with an LED. So you can people can look and see that it's illuminated. I also added a screen door because during the summer, the main door was only opened for uh, uh, at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. You went into this office through that screen door. Again, it's a cardstock piece with a piece of screening behind it to make it look like a screen door. Now we get to the building of the open bay or the garage. This was kind of an interesting part because I had no idea what the other side looked like. I must admit I had to sort of make that up based on what I could see of the photographs. This picture was taken in 1945, 1946, and you can see after the war, after the end of World War II, not a whole lot of brand new cars were on the scene, at least in the little farming town of Emporium, Pennsylvania. There are a lot of old cars from the 30s, a few early 40s cars, but mostly stuff that had to survive through the times of rationing in uh, World War II. So there's the side of the garage. It's got three windows and things like that. Now those windows have some good structural integrity because as I said, they are about seven or eight or nine layers. This window sill is three layers, for example. The top sill is three layers, for example. The windows are two or three layers. So it adds some structural integrity there, but there's not much integrity there. And again, I wanted an interior. So I needed some interior material. So I searched through my CD file and it turns out there's something called O-scale studs and plywood. So if I cut that out and put that on the inside, I've added some structural integrity. And if you want some real structural integrity, take all of these little two by fours, because that's what they are, and actually overlay wood two by fours on top of them that you've stained or painted an appropriate color so that it looks something like that. So now you've got a wall that has some real structural integrity, some wood, you've got tar paper, you've got the windows, and it makes a pretty strong and firm wall. So there's the other side, and that's the only picture I have. And so I know that there is a short part of the building here. There's a, I thought at first that that was a tall part of the building with a brick uh, chimney there. It turns out that's the house behind or across the street. That's not this the part of this structure. So that's a little bit of investigating you have to do too. Here is the air pump. It took me a while to figure out what that is. So we'll go on. Clapboard siding, little white clapboard siding. Again, with the uh, two by fours all framed in. And there you start putting this thing together. These doors, unfortunately, they don't roll up and down. I had thought about trying to make them roll up and down, but ultimately I decided I'd uh, allow it to look something like that with one door down and one door as if it were open all the way because you're going to fill the bay with something else. But you see that the, the, the integrity of the wall remains pretty good. I lived in Florida and I had these things on my layout for as much as 15 years, never warped or anything else, as long as you've got a good air conditioned space. There's the back side. That is a piece of 40 thousandths uh, sheet styrene to make the floor because I wanted to spray paint it a good oh solid concrete gray color and so the the structure sits on top of that styrene floor. This part of the shop was a welding shop I discovered later on but you start putting the interior material into this floor again. My grandfather at that time did not have a lift so if you are old enough like me to remember what it was like. You didn't have a lift underneath here if you wanted to change oil. In fact, there was a pit underneath. You walked down the stairs. They drove the car in over the pit. Sometimes you couldn't even get out of the pit, but you stood in the pit and did all the oil changes and things like that from underneath the pit. My father, my grandfather finally got a lift about 1958, 1959. Until then, there was this service pit and then there was other material here. You can tell that this is long before OSHA because here's a gas station with barrels of oil. 
being heated by a coal stove, which never would happen today. There's oxyacetylene there, never happened today. Stacks of tires, things like that. There's a good old interior of a good old gas station. Of course, you got to have a few risque calendars and things like that on the wall. There it is in that direction. You can see that it's easy to work with. Cardstock is easy to work with. I had a friend ask me once, well, why don't you just use wood? And I said, well, it seems to me that cardstock is made out of wood. It's just pulped and pressed and made into a different form of wood. At any rate, here it is. If you really want to go to the effort, you could actually cut and overlay all of these um, clapboards to give it a, additional dimensionality. Usually good shading by CAD design, you don't need to do that. And again, of course, LED lit interiors and a little uh, circuit. I can't even remember where I bought the circuit from to show the welder inside. And you can see the brick uh, base, and that is cardstock as well. Cardstock printed by CAD design. And then you start searching old photos looking for details where I should uh, where I can find them to make it look as exactly like the old gas station as my uh, grandfather had it. Now that dapper young fellow there isn't really a detail I put in that's my father as he was about to go off to Pennsylvania State College it wasn't Penn State University then Pennsylvania State College where he majored in engineering, a, a, a very strange engineering degree at the time called, uh, elect, I can't remember, something anyway. It was nuclear engineering, and he was um, whisked away and sent off to a place called Los Alamos, New Mexico, to become part of the Manhattan Engineering District, uh, which is where I was born then, in northern New Mexico. The things that I was interested in, though, was the signs, kerosene for sale, Coca-Cola, Goodyear tires, things like that. Those are cans of kerosene's in display, the downspout. So that's what I was interested in. Those were things that I wanted to put onto my uh, model of the gas station. Oops, going the wrong direction here. So there's the Gore service station, and I started looking at these things in front. What else do I need? Well, there are stacks of kerosene. There are tires, have to put some display tires out there. These island, these pump islands had racks of oil and things like that. One of the things that bothered me for a while was that. It took me a long time to figure out what that was. At first, I thought that was somebody sitting on a chair, their head in their hands. And it took me about a year to figure out that those are oil pumps. And so eventually I had to put some oil pumps into the gas station. So oil pumps. Of course, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old kid, what I was interested in was that at the gas station. Because in that glass counter, my grandfather had a contract with Topps baseball cards, and he sold baseball cards, five cents. Now they had penny cards also, or penny packs also, one pack for a penny, and you got one card and one piece of the world's worst bubble gum. If you spent five cents, you got five cards and only one piece of that terrible bubble gum. So I usually tried to save up my pennies so I could get one pack at five cents. Now I was lucky enough to get four of those. For those of you who might happen to know about baseball cards, that's the 1952 Mickey Mantle rookie card. And about eight months ago, one of those sold for $1.4 million uh, to a collector. I will say that I had four of them. One of them I turned into my tuition at the University of Colorado. So maybe it's worth it, maybe it isn't, but at any rate, that's what I was interested in in my grandfather's gas station. Not much else until I decided I wanted to build a version of it. But there's tires and there's oil can racks and things like that. All kinds of details to see. Now there's the gas station pretty much as it uh, was put together. This part 
here I had absolutely no idea what it was. We couldn't tell from the pictures. By the way, this is reversed now on the model. People have given me a hard time about that. My grandfather actually put it up the wrong way the first time. But at any rate, this is actually a corridor so that you can walk between the office and the service bay without having to get too terribly cold during the winter. Tires again, lots and lots of tires. Somebody looking at a motorcycle over there and there are those oil pumps. So yep, there are oil pumps there. And here's an old, oh, I believe that's an old Triumph for a BMW. At any rate, there are those oil pumps. And so here's more or less the finished version. And you can see some of the details, some of the old type style cars and things like that. Um, something that a lot of people, particularly young people, ask me is what is this piece of wire that hang that's laced around the gas station? Well, if you're my age, you know exactly what it's for because when people drove in, it's it's a just simply a wire inside of a tube. When you crossed across it with your tire, it rang a bell inside the station because this is back in the days before self-service. This is when there was a nice attendant in a uniform who came out, checked your water, changed your oil, and filled your gas up. Now, the price of gas back then, for those of you might, who might wonder, was 22 cents a gallon. Yeah, it was pretty expensive back then. So at any rate, there are all kinds of details to be put in there. There's the side of it. This car is actually a Russian car. This is <laughs> this is a, uh, a Gaz, but it's actually based on a license from Chevrolet. It's a Chevy. So at any rate, the only source of water was uh, a well outside. So if they wanted to fill up, for example, this tire tank, they had to take it out in a great big oil can, in a big uh, water can, things like that. There's a 1952 white gas dispenser. I had to put that in. There are the two tanks down below. There's that air pump on a stand and a couple of gentlemen who are about to fill the tanks with two grades of gas, only two, regular and ethyl. People always think that's kind of funny. Why was it called ethyl? Well, if you're a chemist, you know it's tetraethyl lead. Tetraethyl lead gave this an octane of about 93, 94. Regular had an octane of about 91. This is an old Revell kit, by the way. Um, I think I paid on eBay about five, six dollars for it and had it sitting on the shelves for years waiting for an appropriate time to put it on my layout. And there's the gas, gas station sign that sat at the corner of Main Street and Woodland Avenue. This was kind of uh, an interesting sign because I looked at that mobile gas station sign and I saw a couple of words there that I didn't understand. S-O-C-O-N-Y hyphen vacuum. And looking at the sign and having learned French in uh, in uh, high school and, in, and at university, I thought, hmm, maybe that's a French word, sacconi, or something like that. What the heck is sacconi? Well, I found, found out with a little simple search through uh, eBay or through uh, Google, that stands for the Standard Oil Company of New York. It's not French at all. And vacuum, vacuum is the vacuum oil company makers of gargoyle machine oil. Gargoyle machine oil was a mobile oil product, and so they sold cargo oil, machine oil, and various grades of oil for the automobile. Well, that's how the gas station looked until 1956. Then the crash occurred, and this has got nothing to do with the stock market. This has to do with the layout of the town of Emporium. Again, the gas station is right there. This is Main Street heading down towards the Cinnamahoning River, down towards Driftwood this way. Main Street crosses the Driftwood Branch and goes this direction towards the town of St. Mary's. This is Woodland Avenue. My grandfather's house is right here. Here's the gas station. 
if you go across the town or go across the street coming from St. Mary's, you go across this bridge and you have to make a choice. You either turn slightly right and go down Main Street or turn slightly left and go down Woodland Avenue. At about 11 o'clock in the evening in July of 1956, two gentlemen who, as my father said, had a little bit too much medicine, went straight forward and right into the gas pumps at the gas station. And I was visiting my grandfather at the time. I got to be the first person to run around the corner of the gas station and watch two or three gas pumps go up in flames and then fed right into the gas tanks under the gas station and a gas station went up in flames. That's why there's lots of insurance pictures of the old gas station because by the time it got rebuilt in 1958, it looked like that. The old Art Deco gas station of the night, late 1950s, early 1960s. I put this picture in also to mention some other details. There's a white picket fence and actually a uh, shrub sort of hedge along the back of the gas station. My grandmother didn't want to watch the gas station from her house. So she also planted some very large pine trees also to sort of obscure the picture of the gas station. So I had to include those on the model as well. So I see I've taken about 10 minutes early and actually I'm done. That's how I built grandpa's gas station. If you have questions about cardstock modeling or anything else, this is my ON30 layout, the Hamas and Rio Grande. And uh, this is the old yard in my town of Santa Fe before it became uh, bits and pieces as it gets transferred up to, uh, up to uh, New Hampshire here. I'll rebuild my layout in about another year or so. So. Ready for some questions? Ready for some questions, Speed. So first one was, is this all done in HO or O scale? O scale. You can do it in HO. It's a matter of printing out. Now this particular company, Clever Models, uh, prints out all of their plans or all of their models in O scale. But all you have to do is tell your printer to print it out in 48 over 87 scale and it's HO. Nice. Someone wants to know, what did you use for the screen on that door? Oh, <laughs> interestingly enough, I used a set of my wife's old stockings mm -hmm. and simply stretched them taut so that there was, so that you could actually see the weave. And I put them, stretched them over a frame. I spray painted them with some fixative. Uh, it was Krylon matte finish, I think, that, uh, and then spray painted it a gray color. And when you took it off the frame, it didn't snap back because the uh, fixative caused it not to, to snap back. And then I just glued it onto the frame. Cool. I've also noticed that some uh, more expensive tea bags comes with the similar texture. Correct. You can, you can use. That's a good idea. Um, now you showed a bunch of things that they exhibited on the outside of the gas station. Uh -huh. Some boxes and, and wheels and tires. Did they have to put that back every night in, on the inside? They did indeed. They marched them all back inside the uh, either the office or into the uh, into the service bay, locked it all up, and went home. These were in the days when gas stations were not open 24 hours. This opened at about seven in the morning, closed up about eight o'clock in the evening. In the big uh, explosion, was anybody hurt? Well, the two fellows who hit the gas station or hit the pumps did not survive. Oh, no. But uh, other than that, um, everything else was fine. It was just a big burning fire for about five or six hours while the local fire department tried to put it out. Oh, no. <laughs> have you ever considered adding a real bell to the wire that you put on the perimeter? Actually, I have. And I've, I've, I've discovered that somewhere, I've got it written down somewhere else, there's actually a manufacturer who has a sound effect, a sound effect of that bell. I suppose I could have put a real bell in there too, but uh, <laughs> but I well, think I like the electronic sound effect better. <laughs> uh, 
is a double question here. What do you use to cut your cardstock with, and what kind of adhesive do you use okay. to glue it together? I use um, a good old number 11 blade, a very tight one, a very sharp one. My rule of, of thumb is that I go through one blade per side of building. So I have plenty of blades um, uh, uh, at hand when I start building a cardstock model. If you build with, uh, or if you cut with a number 11 blade, for example, it will dull pretty quickly. Paper is, is not very forgiving um, as opposed to say flesh, which is pretty forgiving if you've ever cut yourself with a number 11 blade. But paper is not very forgiving and so it blunts very quickly. And so I use a number 11 blade to uh, 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 the adhesive I use I use actually a combination of adhesives depending upon the surface. I usually use um, a medium viscosity uh, CA glue. And I must admit I'm a, a cheap SOB, so I don't use expensive uh, CA glue. I use Gorilla, the Gorilla medium viscosity. It's the cheapest around and it works just fine. And you can use Zip Kicker on it. Zip Kicker won't cause the uh, dies to run or anything like that and then sometimes if it's a much larger surface i use rocket card glue which is uh, manufactured in the uk but you can buy it off of amazon and it sets almost a little bit faster than ca does it sets very quickly but it's an acrylic glue uh -huh. and there's not a lot of water in it so it doesn't cause the dies to run either oh, okay uh, someone's asking, is the red-white flooring in the door in the back of the office actually flooring or it just look the way it is? Um, it just looks that way. It was printed that way with the office. Okay. So it was printed that way with a bit of a shadow to make it look like there was some depth. But it's one-dimensional as far as the print goes. But if you see it from two or three inches, if you're looking through the window, it looks like... Uh, a regular old uh, door going into another office. Yeah. So over on YouTube, there's a few more questions as well. Mm -hmm. um, is the garage portion of the building the current location of the spot? Someone's probably asking if uh, where the garage was, if it's if it's part of the the spot. Um, yes, it is. The garage, the garage still exists, but it's of course this old new Art Deco building now, and it's a single unit, uh, as these Art Deco buildings were, mm -hmm. not these two separate two separate structures. Unfortunately, the only picture I have of that, uh, the new building, it doesn't you can't see it very well, but it's a it's a, a single unit structure. Okay, and do you have um, any pre 1875 model buildings? Um, I do on my layout, yes. Um, I have a lot of uh, structures that are, say, uh, false front buildings and things like that on my layout because it's Western U.S., Southwestern U.S. And so, yeah, you can build false front structures. Uh, takes a little bit of extra folding and fitting because you have to build a, fa uh, build a very long, thin box to make the false front. Mm -hmm. But yes, you can make false front structures also. Larry wants to know, what is the number of cleaver, plywood, and studs? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I don't know exactly what that number is. Um, I can probably back through this pretty quickly and find it. Uh, it is, get down there. No, got to back up. There it is. It is TO STD 05A. And if you are, if you know about Clever Models, their website, you can buy each one of these textures individually. I think they're probably about a dollar or a dollar and a half a piece. And once the, it's sent to you as a PDF, and you own it forever. Oh, okay. And you can print as many as you want, as many times as you want. Once you own that particular, uh, that particular piece of texture. 
And Mike wants to know, uh, where did you get the uh, O-scale gas pumps? Oh, well, actually, I went to um, a 148th, 143rd um, metal automobile manufacturer. Um, I've forgotten the name of the company at the time. Uh, at any rate, there are several different manufacturers who manufacture collectors automobiles. And the collector automobiles may cost $40, $50 a piece. I don't buy those, mm -hmm. but they do have some um, gas pumps for sale. And they're about $10 a pair. They're not exactly cheap, but that's where I got them from. Um, I've forgotten the name of the manufacturer off the top of my head, but uh, it's uh, there are several manufacturers that have them if and they sell collectors, uh, 148th, 125th, uh, 143rd type uh, automobiles. And all scales. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any trouble with the interior illumination flowing through the cardstock walls? No, actually, if you have at least two layers of cardstock, and one of them is a dark layer, for example, uh, you can illuminate it and it won't go through the wall. Now, a single layer of cardstock, it will. And so you okay. have to be careful to back your wall with at least a dark layer of cardstock. And it won't, even two layers, it won't go through the cardstock wall. So you don't paint them black on the inside? No, not at all. Um, someone wants to know because they don't know about this video going on YouTube yet, but they want to know if you have other videos on YouTube. I do not. I'm not a, a big uh, social media YouTube kind of person, I must admit. When I've got time off, even though I'm retired, I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> uh, when I have time off, I'd rather spend it at the workbench. So I really don't uh, spend a lot of time putting videos together and things like that, unfortunately. I do have a Facebook page that's just called J and RJ, J with an ampersand RG. Mm -hmm. That's my railroad. And on that Facebook page, if you scroll back far enough, I have a number of tutorials on um, building various cardstock structures. But uh, that's as close as I can get. I don't do any YouTubes, I'm afraid to say. Okay, so I'll save my question for last. But since we have quite a few more minutes left. Would you mind telling us about uh, modeling with the masters, maybe how it came about sure. or how it's still run? About, um, about 20, gosh, probably close to 25 years ago, uh, a guy by the name of Clark Kooning, a Canadian, um, came up with the idea of a class for any member of the NMRA to attend. And at the time it was held in Chattanooga and you would pay um, at what at the time, about 25 years ago, was a pretty good chunk of money, about $1,500. Wow. And uh, I think maybe it was a thousand. At any rate, you would go to the uh, to Chattanooga, and it was a two-day, three-day session. There was a banquet and everything else, and they had instructors there, and they would do about a half a dozen projects and things like that. And they thought, well, maybe we'll sell oh, a half a dozen or so uh, memberships, if you will, or uh, recruits to the Modeling with the Masters program. And it turns out that uh, they filled it within about a month. Wow. And they ran it that way a couple of years, and then Clark suggested it be held at the National Convention. And ultimately, it is now held at the National Convention. It runs four days. We start on a... Uh, Sunday, excuse me, Monday morning usually. And we go from about 7 in the morning till 11 o'clock at night, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday until a Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday until noon. So you go, you have three or four long days. You can sign up for individual sessions. We have four instructors usually. And those four instructors take turns directing or leading the discussion and giving a demonstration on how to construct everything from cardstock models to scratch building with styrene, scratch building certain structures with wood, uh, how to make scenery. Uh, right now, we've got a, a team taught one that Peter Youngblood and I do on 
building roads and making roadside details. Clark Kooning is still an instructor. Clark uh, passed the mantle of manager over to me a couple of years ago. And so, but Clark is still an instructor and he does one, for example, on uh, DPM models, how to build and detail and paint DPM models. Uh, we have one on, uh, at any rate, we have a whole series of them and they rotate. Each topic is offered for two years or two national conventions and then a new instructor comes along or a new instructor comes up or the same old instructors come up with new topics to run two more years. And I can't think off the top of my head what we've got planned for Santa Clara right now, but uh, it's essentially, essentially what would have been in St. Louis had St. Louis not been canceled. So uh, it'll be in the Santa Clara uh, National instead. Cool. Now, is it still expensive? Well, each session will cost you about uh, $45. This is outside of registration for the uh, meeting and your hotel costs and everything else. Right. When it originally started off, that was a flat rate that paid for your room, all your meals and everything else. Now it's okay. uh, per session kind of thing. So it's around $45 is what we charge per person to uh, take these lessons and the class sizes are limited to about 24 persons. And uh, we have a room cardened off and all equipped with tables and all the material that's needed. You're paying for the material. You're not paying us. We don't get paid to uh, instruct you or anything else. We do it out of the goodness of our heart and our enthusiasm for model railroad modeling and mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, we get, uh, you know, we get just satisfaction out of it. We don't get paid. You pay for the materials. Really, really nice. Okay, so my last question is, mm -hmm. you still have three of those baseball cards left, right? Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do with the $3 million? <laughs> well, they're not graded as essentially mint and extra fine, so they wouldn't go for that $3 million. <laughs> I have no idea. I'll probably will them to, to, to some of my offspring, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I always held them in reserve in case somebody winds up wanting to go to a very expensive university that I can't afford. <laughs> but they're all out yeah. and on their own, and they're doing quite well. So I have no idea what I'll do with those cards. <laughs> well, Jim, thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was really interesting and a bit of history as well. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay.